Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, this and other public television stations, and the Ford Foundation. I've been coming to the Philippines since the 1950s. For an American, landing in Manila is a shock of recognition. For half a century, half a world away, this was America's only colony, and the flavor is still American. Inside to outside, right here on the number one pop music station in Metro Manila. Disc jockeys, Many buses modeled on jeeps, billboards, public buildings, fast food outlets, all evoke America. America's two largest overseas bases are here. supporting America's presence from the Pacific to the Persian Gulf. Before America came at the turn of the century, Spain ruled for 300 years, making the Philippines the only Christian nation in Asia. It can be almost medieval Christianity as dramatized in this reenactment of the crucifixion. The centuries of colonialism also made the Philippines the most westernized nation of Asia. This series looks at how the Americans got to the Philippines, what they did there, what they left there. They wanted to remold the Filipinos in the American image. In our image. The United States was booming at the turn of the century. It was fast becoming the world's leading industrial nation. Its mines, mills, and factories were turning out coal, iron, steel, consumer goods. Immigrants were swelling its labor force. New roads, railways, and telegraph lines linked its cities. The people's pulse is quick, nervous, feverish, wrote a newspaper editor at the time. Americans were bursting with new power and national pride. This dynamic youth and energy built up pressures to propel America beyond its shores for the first time in history. 
Veterans and their families commemorate the Spanish-American War. An American official called it a splendid little war. For the first time, America fought overseas. It began in the spring of 1898, when the United States decided to free Cuba from Spanish rule. Theodore Roosevelt, the young assistant secretary of the Navy, sent a small American squadron against the Spanish fleet in the Philippines. As he steamed into Manila Bay, Commodore George Dewey gave an order to his flagship captain, you may fire when you are ready, Mr. Gridley. It was no contest. Dewey sank the antiquated Spanish Armada in seven hours. Only one American died of heat prostration. Dewey later returned home to a tumultuous ovation. Americans also celebrated their new role as a world power despite divisions over whether to keep the Philippines. In Washington, President McKinley and his cabinet pondered their next move. After much debate, McKinley decided to make the Philippines an American colony. Meanwhile, the Filipinos had declared independence and founded a republic. Emilio Aguinaldo, their president, had fought the Spanish for years. His young officers, drawn mostly from prominent families, hoped for U.S. recognition, but the Americans rejected them. On the night of February 4, 1899, a new war broke out, this time between Americans and Filipinos. Americans, filled with patriotism, had a new sense of mission. But when they called for volunteers, oh, why, it, there was an onrush of the young people. They had no trouble getting the young men to go and join. There was no drafts. There wasn't a, there wasn't a draft. Now, his father didn't want him to join, but he went right on and joined anyway because he said he had to go. They went there to try to free those people. Harry Embry volunteered at the age of 17. When we interviewed him, he was 104, the last living veteran of the Philippine War. He died in 1988. I wanted to see a foreign country. And I wanted to see mountains and oceans. It was a, a different world, so different from anything I'd ever seen. It's so different. Official U.S. Army records still call it the Philippine Insurrection. In reality, it was a war of conquest that lasted two and a half years. At its peak, 70,000 American soldiers were involved. A basket of carrier pigeons to deliver his dispatches, John Bass of Harper's Weekly covered the American troops in action. As we approached Kalu Khan, the bullets came thicker and thicker. In the road, dead Filipinos lay here and there like disfigured dolls thrown away by some petulant child. Squads of men move from house to house to try to clear out the remaining insurgents. But sharpshooters had lodged in the houses, and the town had to be burned. It was hot, and uh, it was uh, mosquito-infested country. You know, they traveled by foot. There was no other way of them traveling anywhere. And uh, in their walking, his feet were injured that he never did uh, 
recuperate from the, the that walking and serving. And the shoes, sometimes they just wouldn't fit and they'd have to wear them anyway. Really, his blanket was all he had. That was his bed, that was his tent. And the food was very poor. And their water was just whatever they could get. Those young men didn't mind it because they had already put their lives on the altar, you might say. And they had volunteered in the first place. So they had no idea or desire to turn back. The war captured the imagination of Thomas Edison. With his newly invented movie camera, he reenacted heroic scenes of the fighting in New Jersey. The real war was not so glorious. Filipinos adopted guerrilla tactics, and American progress was slow. Determined to win, President McKinley declared, the Philippines are ours. We must put down the rebellion. American commanders in the Philippines tried to manage the news through censorship. Correspondents eluded them by sending their dispatches from nearby Hong Kong. A year after the war began, John Bass was gloomy. Why is it that the American outlook is blacker now than it has been since the beginning of the war? The equipment of the Army has been absurdly inadequate. To load volunteers down with 200 rounds of ammunition and one day's rations, and put on their heads felt hats used by no other Army in the world in the tropics, is positively criminal. There are 5,000 men in the general hospital today, or 16% of the whole army. The American advance has about reached the end of its rope. Unless the insurgents fall to pieces by natural disintegration, the insurrection will prosper for some time to come. But Bass failed to see that the Americans were in fact winning. Early in 1901, they captured Emilio Aguinaldo, the Filipino leader. But on remote islands like Samar, the Filipino resistance continued. An episode that occurred there late in 1901 is now local folklore. <laughs> Captain Thomas W. Connell, a West Pointer, arrived in Samar with a company of 74 men. His orders were to crush the resistance. Nakatira uma, nag kinkukwaniran mga tanong. Kakaras ni Rangkuan, kamutis, kim bobon, ang kung kim sosonog ang mga humay. Nawawara na ni Rapagkaon. Eh, wari naman lalaki nga makakatrabaho kay ito man mga priso. Ang pisan ko an, aga hato nga 28, ginordinan niya ang mga kabayan niya early in the morning. At timprano bang aga, mag-evacuate ang kawa. The American troops were eating breakfast when the Filipinos struck. The Filipinos, many disguised as women, had concealed their weapons. They took the Americans by surprise. 52 Americans were killed, 22 escaped by boat. The massacre shocked the U.S. public. Major Littleton Waller was ordered to retaliate. His commander, General Jacob Smith, told him to kill every Filipino over the age of 10. Smith was court-martialed, convicted, and dismissed. American newspapers that once supported the war were now critical of the struggle. The American public, once enthusiastic, was now disgusted by its brutality. By now, some 200,000 Filipinos had been killed, most of them civilians. 4,000 American soldiers were dead. 
But the Americans finally imposed peace and began their colonial rule. They hoped to implant American values and they made education a priority. A thousand American school teachers landed in 1901 and went to every part of the country. There was a saying those days that one American school teacher was worth a thousand American soldiers in the problem of pacifying the Philippines. That's obviously an exaggeration, but there's no question that an unarmed American was ready to go out there and teach these kids how to talk English uh, was far more powerful than a soldier carrying a gun around. But um, their job was fighting, and it was in contrast with the teacher's job. The two of them got the job done. William Howard Taft, America's first civilian governor, shaped early colonial policy. The Filipinos, he said, were our little brown brothers. He hoped to convert them to American ways. The idea was to create the first public school system in Asia. The Filipinos wanted their kids educated. The Spaniards had never made this possible for any except the rich. And the American uh, teacher taught very quickly, the Filipino parent, that his, the way for his kid to get out in the world was to go to school and learn. That many a family sold its caramel in order to let a kid go to school. Although the schools were free, it, uh, they, they lost one worker, and um, they had to buy textbooks, and they had to buy clothes for their children. The, the living was, was rough, there's no doubt about that, compared to anything in the United States. It took them six weeks to get mail from their homes, and they uh, would, uh, sometimes they'd accumulate the mail and open it a, a day a week, and so they'd stay even with it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't use it all up at once. One of the big books in my childhood was the Montgomery Ward catalog in which we would pick out all our Christmas presents that we wanted and send the order back in August or September, and we would have the things back in time for Christmas holiday. Uh, there were no uh, Christmas trees as such, uh, but palm tree would work all right. But there was this feeling that they were working on something very important, and uh, they enjoyed it. So there was a missionary zeal. Simply, we are working in a, in a new field, and we're creating a nation. I could uh, tell you who the American presidents were, when the American Civil War was, why it was fought, and so forth and so on. I couldn't tell you uh, what the heroes of the Philippines were, except for a few. Hmm? The curriculum was designed so that uh, we would learn more of American principles and American ideas than of ourselves. The, the content was, uh, was, was American, and uh, it was so designed as to make us uh, uh, believe that the American was 10 feet tall. The acceptance of English here was uh, complete, total, unresisted, I think because it came with education, no? with the educational system. But of course, a language never comes just as uh, like an empty, uh, empty train. It always comes loaded with its culture. So along with it came uh, American values, American heroes, American stories, uh, history. I think an immediate uh, reaction was that people uh, started to sing American songs and dress American, such that maybe the Filipino equivalent of the flapper would be the Filipina who moved from wearing the traditional terno, the Filipino dress, to the short American dress, you know, low-waisted, started to curl her hair. You know, Filipinas usually have long, straight uh, uh, hair in buns or something. And uh, started to maybe smoke cigarettes. 
which horrified the the older people. So in came American songs, eventually American movies, American radio programs, magazines, comic books, and this just transformed the Filipino into, instead of a Hispanic uh, model, into an Ameri American model. They saw themselves acting and dressing as people in the American movies and in the American magazines. Ano? Ano nang nangyari sa'yo? Hindi kanya ng pagkanta niya. Kantahin mo kagaya ng dati. Bakit niya ako pinipilit pa kantahin ng English? Sinabi ko na sa inyo hindi ako maari. Bakit din niya ako pantahin ng Tagalog? Oy, alamin mo na tayo ang nasa Manila. At ang dapat mong kantahin ay English. Sapagkat ang nakikinig, nasusuya na sa mga kanta ng Tagalog. Ulitin natin. Upper-class Filipino families dreamed of sending their children to college in the United States. Americanization was the key to success. All the first scholars were taken from all the top families in every province. So uh, since my father be belonged to that level, he and his brother were chosen. He was sent to a small teacher's college in Macomb, Illinois. He was completely brainwashed. I mean, <laughs> he was really, he loved the Americans, the American way of life. He loved American food. Oh, he, he enjoyed himself very much and he learned a lot. Now, I come to the Philippines, come back home to an American run colony. And this, young men who just came from the States and learned all about equality and freedom and democracy, and then were shocked to find out that in their own country, the Americans had set aside certain areas where they were not even supposed to show their brown faces. I recall as a law student, I was uh, a, a reporter for a Spanish paper, and I went to the university club, which is, which is American, and I was thrown out of it. And uh, I was not the only one. There were other cases where uh, Filipinos were thrown out of the Army and Navy club. And this, this of course, uh, created a lot of, uh, of ruckus here, because uh, we couldn't uh, imagine uh, ourselves being thrown out of uh, places within our own country. But uh, that was the... Uh, exception rather than the rule. Otherwise, the relationship was, was very cordial. The pace of life in Manila during the 1920s and 30s was leisurely, especially for rich Filipinos and the American community. Colonial status gave Americans luxuries and privileges they could never enjoy at home. Jack Manning grew up in Manila. They were delightful years for me, living a young colonial a life that was very, very pleasant. And our associations there were primarily with uh, Europeans and Americans. My life it was primarily polo club, uh, Army Navy club. I like to think back of something my mother said about me, and that was that I was 21 years old before I learned to tie my own shoelaces, because it had always been done for me as I grew up. We had a gardener, we had a houseboy, we had a chauffeur, we had a cook. So sure, from that standpoint, it was, it was uh, a great life. Malakanyan Palace had some of the great parties of all time, Frank Murphy of all people would invite uh, the prettiest Filipino girls in the world there. He had great orchestras. He brought in uh, the Gershom's music from time to time. And uh, uh, Murphy was, uh, he was a bachelor, but he set the pace for a very good gay life and among Americans and Filipinos both.
America imposed a typically colonial economy. The Philippines produced commodities for the U.S. market, chiefly timber, minerals, coconut oil, and sugar. And American business enjoyed a monopoly in the Philippines for its exports. The system favored big Filipino landlords and discouraged the growth of local industry. In 1916, the U.S. Congress pledged eventual freedom to the Filipinos. We were promised independence, and we, we believed that it was coming, that it was just a matter of time, that if we were ready for it, we would get it. Now that the American government was here, was hopefully a very temporary thing. Filipinos frequently demonstrated for independence, but there was little hostility toward the United States. 13 million Filipinos have an abiding faith in the righteousness of the American people. They trust that as America loves freedom, so freedom will be granted them. When that is accomplished, America will have written the noblest page in history, and the Filipinos will look back with gratitude upon the day God gave victory to American arms at Manila and placed their country under the benign guidance of the United States. Filipino delegations traveled to Washington to negotiate independence. But many Filipinos feared freedom and the loss of the U.S. market for their goods. They also worried that America's departure would leave them unprotected. Some even wanted to make the Philippines a state of the Union. Manuel Quezon was president of the Philippine Commonwealth, signed into law by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1934. Independence was scheduled in 10 years. We are about to establish and put into operation the government of the Commonwealth of the Philippines as ordained by the Congress of the United States. This event is another landmark in your steady progress toward the fulfillment of your aspirations to be a completely independent, sovereign nation. I Manuel Luis Quezon, hereby solemnly swear that I will faithfully and conscientiously fulfill my duties as President of the Philippines, and I hereby declare that I recognize and accept the supreme authority of the United States of America in the Philippines, and will maintain through faith and allegiance there too. So help me God. This, ladies and gentlemen, my wife, Mrs. Queso, my supporter, friend, and companion, and the dear mother of these children, this is Aurora, the eldest. There is Senaida, the next. And this boy is the crown prince. Well now, boy, don't you want to say something to the children of America? I send them my love. But Japan now threatened Asia, and America trained the Filipinos to defend themselves. The program was entrusted to a veteran Philippine hand, General Douglas MacArthur. The Philippines Defense Act is, in effect, a charter of individual liberty and national freedom. Its purpose is to preserve the integrity of the only Christian state in the Far East, to perpetuate ideals of religious freedom, personal liberty, and Republican government, which have, under American tutelage, flowered here into fruition. The government simply provides a means whereby its citizens 
may be so organized, equipped, and trained as to be prepared and ready to defend their country. The plan is a pure product of democracy. We felt if the war was going to start on the mainland of Asia, there would be no way that uh, it would not uh, involve the Philippines. And to us, the, the position in the Philippines was crucial. It was our possession. It was, uh, nobody liked the word colony, but it was our colony. And uh, we felt that we should protect the Philippines in the same way we would uh, protect California or the state of New Hampshire. The Philippines was not ready for war, but then it came without warning. The Japanese struck on December 8, 1941, at the same time they attacked Pearl Harbor. And the Japanese planes were so low that uh, we could see the pilots. We could see pilots just waving out at uh, almost like a cartoon where they were waving out to the people below. And, and uh, there were people in our office that were sure that these were German pilots. A good many of us still had such a low opinion of Japanese capabilities that uh, we didn't believe that they were uh, Japanese planes. But the realities very quickly um, came into focus. And we realized that um, uh, this was honest to God war. General MacArthur was caught by surprise when the Americans suffered heavily. Their naval base near Manila was destroyed. They lost almost all their planes on the ground. The Japanese claimed to be liberating the Philippines. We were still in high school, and the Japanese propaganda machine was already working and uh, uh, telling us that uh, uh, this is no place for the Americans. This is a place for the Asians. Asia for the Asians, that's what they were saying. The Japanese were aware of uh, some of these social difficulties. And the first leaflet that they dropped and said that when we liberate you, this is the day of, of liberating the, the Filipinos. And when, uh, when we liberate you, never again will you be uh, aliens in your own land and restricted from uh, the Army and Navy Club. On December 22nd, 1941, the first waves of Japanese marched toward Manila. Most American and Filipino troops retreated to Corregidor and the Bataan Peninsula at the mouth of Manila Bay. We knew that they were landing in other places in the Philippines. We knew there would be a pincer's uh, movement which would sooner or later close in on Manila. And the problem came, when do you say to the Filipino people, yes, Manila is going to fall? On December 22, um, orders came from Washington that the military forces should make Manila an open city. And I had no written instructions, deliberately so, and I was simply told to do the best I can, and that was all. As the Japanese entered Manila, the American and Filipino forces were trapped on Bataan and Corregidor. They were short of food, water, and medicine. On orders from Washington, General MacArthur escaped to Australia with his family. President Quezon went with him. When I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Yeah. Tonight, I repeat those words. Yeah. 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 I shall return. Yeah. There was no escape for the American and Filipino soldiers. On the 9th of April of 1942, we were forced to surrender. It was just a, really a fight to the death. It, it was just the last ditch stand. We had en not encouragement, but direction from General MacArthur's headquarters that you will fight to the bitter end. Surrender is hopeless. It'd be futile to surrender. 
So we tried to abide by those instructions, but finally it got to a point where we just couldn't resist any longer. We had to give up disease, starvation, even lack of water. Never before had America been so badly beaten. The Japanese were the masters of Asia. They assembled us in groups of 100, four abreast, searched us, took away whatever they wanted, and practically everything we had, they took away. We heard continuous shots during the march. If you straggled or if you fell down exhausted, that was sudden death. They didn't have time for it. That was the end of it. A Japanese soldier, I, I looked down on him to a certain extent because he was so small, except for the fact that his rifle made him look a hell of a lot taller. Uh, he come across the road and pulled my canteen out of my cover and uh, took a big drink of water out of my canteen, pulled the plug out of his canteen and filled his canteen out of mine, poured the rest of my water out on the ground and then threw the canteen down in front of me. The next morning, they took me and beat me up both sides of my damn legs. I still got scars there where they beat me. It antagonized me at the time and I'm still antagonized. It's been 45 years and I'm still mad. There's really not anything pleasant that I can recall about the March of Death, except one thing, and that was the beautiful Filipino people who did their best very valiantly to help us, oftentimes at the risk of their own life. They would try to give you a drink of water, they would try to pass a piece of sugar to you, or whatever they could do to make it a little easier for you. And many of them were killed because of that. Because the Japanese did not want any Filipinos to dim display any affection or loyalty to the American forces. The bodies of dead Americans were literally just lining both sides of the road, both sides of the ditches, were dead Americans. I saw a Japanese tank deliberately swerve from its course and run over an American and just flatten him into the ground. His body became a, a part of the road. He was so flattened. The tanks, the trucks, the uh, artillery pieces moved by horses, by cavalry, coming in the opposite direction, just a mass of cloud, of dust. The first thing I realized was the dust was so heavy, I couldn't see the guards across the road there. So I turned and made a break then. Robinette was rescued by Filipino guerrillas, the Hooks, led by communists and socialists. They were mostly poor peasants who fought both their landlords and the Japanese. We never had a base camp as such. Everything stayed on the move. The Japanese realized because you had troops moving back and forth across the countryside that they could not control any more of the population than what they could look at over a rifle barrel. If they were going to move, they had to move large units for protection. The other thing was to go ahead and disrupt their communication lines as much as possible, blow up their bridges. They used a lot of telephonic communication, and all it takes is a straight pin shoved through a telephone wire to short circuit the damn thing out. The individuals I was work living with and working with the farmers or the fishermen or uh, the peon. They had very little. They worked their uh, life away there for uh, possibly as much as uh, $100, $125 a year, but they could never get ahead. During the period of operations there, I never I never saw a landlord as such. They were all uh, in Manila. The, uh, I think part of it was possibly fear of the hooks and what could happen. Uh, and part of it was the fact that uh, it was easier living in Manila and collaborating with the Japanese. The Japanese expected the Filipinos to welcome them as fellow Asians, 
and many did. Many more Filipinos were in the position of collaborators that were in the position of, of guerrillas. Everybody that could go to the hills or had relatives in the countryside called himself a guerrilla. And those that had nowhere to go, had no alternative, just had simply had to live by their wits under the Japanese. And I sympathize like anything with these people who, with their protectors gone, which we Americans were, simply had to live. And uh, no love of the Japanese, no hatred of the Americans. You simply had a, a real situation where you had to take care of yourself. The Japanese made Jose Laurel their puppet president. A noted lawyer, American educated, he had served Japanese firms in the Philippines before the war. He admired the Japanese for their discipline and sense of purpose. His son, Salvador, was elected vice president in 1986. The reaction of uh, my father when the Japanese uh, offered to grant independence to the Philippines uh, in 1943 was, of course, uh, welcomed. Uh, how could anyone be against the grant of Philippine independence? But, uh, of course, there were people who knew that uh, independence under a Japanese-occupied Philippines was not going to be the real kind of independence that they had in mind. The Japanese showered leaflets hailing independence. The collaborators went along, insisting that they were shielding the population from the Japanese. And so it was up to them to continue in some kind of position of leadership, but they had new people behind them. Uh, instead of the Americans wielding the actual power, the Japanese wielded the actual power, and they had to do what their Japanese masters forced them to do. Now, therefore, I... Jose P. Laurel, President of the Republic of the Philippines, do hereby proclaim that a state of war exists between the Republic of the Philippines and the United States of America and Great Britain. The Japanese interned American civilians at Santa Tomas, an ancient Spanish university on the outskirts of Manila. Each room elected himself a leader, and uh, the rooms and floors elected their leaders. And uh, it wasn't long, a question of hours, before we had a group of uh, responsible um, uh, pre-war leaders uh, uh, duly elected by common consent to represent us. We had doctors and lawyers, and, and uh, we had uh, engineers and uh, businessmen in the camp, and their wives and their children. But we were short of food from the beginning. The Japanese permitted contact at what we called the gate, into which the Filipino friends uh, were permitted to come and pass a package under Japanese uh, supervision. We played softball right up to 19, uh, early 1944, uh, and the Japanese were fascinated with that. The Commandant's office the staff all came down to watch our baseball. We even had marriages in the camp amongst internees. The rest of the community life was purely and simply, as I say, of tending to the garden, uh, looking after the sick, and uh, doing the best you could in the way of food for survival. Japanese propaganda films made life look good for military prisoners. Sam Gracio, a pilot, was among the captives. In the Camp O'Donnell, the first camp that we were imprisoned in, they buried 1,100 Americans and 14,000 Filipinos in just a two-month period. Uh, Americans were dying at about 150 a day. Filipinos were dying at about 500 a day. Uh, dead bodies would be around the camp maybe for two or three days before they were recovered and put in a grave. Uh, the food was bad. You lined up. It would take you forever and a day to get through the mess line. It was terrible rice, worms and rocks in the rice. Um, they had one water spigot for almost 15,000 people. Many guys stayed in line eight, nine, ten hours. They would get to the water spigot, 
the Japanese would turn the water off. I came to the conclusion during the first two or three months of imprisonment that the Japanese had an intention. They wanted us to die. The Japanese occupation was, was uh, one of the most traumatic periods of my life. I, I can hardly talk about it still. The Japanese occupation had taught a whole people that the only way you could survive was to take what wasn't yours. Lots of people did things that they would not ordinarily have done. Fathers would keep food from their sons, and brothers would keep uh, food from their sisters. And then old friends would deny each other uh, just a spoonful of, of uh, powdered milk or sugar. So that in those three years, the entire um, fabric of society, of, of morality, of ethics, became uh, that you had to do whatever you could to remain alive. There were guns hidden under our house, and my father-in-law uh, gave contributions to the guerrillas. And somebody must have tipped off the Japanese about that. We didn't know. In one night, uh, six men were taken away from our home. My, f my husband, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, the cook, the houseboy, and the carpenter. They didn't explain. They just uh, came in and herded everybody into the, into the um, sub-kitchen and then uh, tortured the men, searched the house, took all the men away to be shot. In October 1944, American forces returned to the Philippines. Two days before the October 20th landing, uh, Halsey's fleet came into the, into the Tacloban area, bombarding the whole area with, with uh, fire. I'll tell you, it was a night of hell, but yet it was welcomed because they knew that MacArthur was returning. And despite the, the bombardment of the beaches and in the area there, uh, there was no sign of resentment at all on the, on the people. It was a welcome thing because they knew that liberation was coming. It was a remarkable scene to see because there was a fleet of some 600 ships. You had all these battleships and the hundreds and hundreds of small landing craft they were out in the bay at Tacloban. The tears come streaming down, down your face uh, as, as if something, it was just a beautiful thing. It was just a beautiful thing to be able to witness the liberation of so many people who wanted so badly and so desperately to be liberated. And here, here it was, here it was, the man was coming. I shall return, and he kept his promise. When we heard that MacArthur landed in Leyte, all of us went to town, and we were running after the tanks, and we say, Uncle Sam, give us chocolate. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I can still remember that. Gratitude is the greatest uh, virtue, and therefore you cannot talk against MacArthur here. They will stone you, <laughs> because that man saved us. Because he promised this country, I shall return. And he did return. The battle for Luzon, the most populous Philippine island, was one of the biggest of World War II. Early in 1945, American forces entered Manila. Their first objective was to free the American civilians interned at Santo Tomas.
and uh, food was brought in to to the to the camp area where you could have seen the the delight, uh, the smiles, and the cheers as uh, these uh, crates of food were carried into the area, and uh, the 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 internees had to be reminded that they couldn't help themselves too 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 much to the food because having been on such short rations for so many years, having a filled stomach couldn't make them very ill. But uh, there were many, many sick stomachs because it was the first time they had seen food in such abundance. But the battle for Manila was just beginning. To spare civilians, MacArthur refused to allow airstrikes. His artillery was just as destructive. The main Japanese force withdrew from the city, but many enemy troops remained. Trapped, they unleashed their fury on the population. So the rest of Manila, south of the river, uh, the Pasig River, was cut off. And there the Japanese went on a rampage. They knew they were trapped, and so I think they just went crazy. It was an orgy of killing and destruction, completely insane. Japanese soldiers uh, bayoneting children and then shooting at, at women and, and uh, old men when they cross the streets and just setting fire to houses and waiting until their, their uh, occupants ran into the street and then shooting them down. And they, in Ermita, they took away um, droves of young girls to the Bayview Hotel to, and they were I could hear their screams uh, as they were being raped. Along with Warsaw, Manila was the most devastated Allied city of World War II. At least 100,000 civilians were killed. Manila was flat. I, I was breathless when I, I stood at the post office and I could look all the way up to past the Ateneo to La Salle. It's a stretch of about two kilometers. It was flat. Flat. There was not left a stone upon a stone. You couldn't find out where a house was. You couldn't even find a corner from which to measure off where the house ought to be. It was flat. Blair Robinette was now a guerrilla commander north of Manila. The Americans rolled in, and uh, when I first saw them, uh, it looked to be like the German army different helmets, uh, equipment I'd never seen before, uh, vehicles I'd never seen before. Everything was strange. They wanted to know who was in charge, and I told them who I was. The American captain uh, told me, he said, uh, well, disband your men because we're here, we'll take over now. And uh, I said, do you have any way you could use them? He said, no. He said, just disband them. So I assembled everybody, gave them a hill and farewell speech, and uh, told them to go back to the farms and uh, be good boys. But his wartime guerrillas, the Hooks, kept their weapons and later rebelled against the government. Impoverished peasants, they wanted land of their own. They deserved far better than what they had. And uh, the, the only thing that I could see that uh, would have provided it would have been massive land reforms in the Philippines. But MacArthur was no reformer. His aim was to restore the old Filipino power structure. 
He also restored America's influence, which was to remain decisive even after the Philippines became independent. I see that the old flagstaff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. Funding for this program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, this and other public television stations, and the Ford Foundation. Schools, colleges, public libraries, and other organizations may purchase video cassettes by calling 800-424-7963.